We've been involved in this series, Grace Alone, and we've been discovering that God in his grace, his mercy, and his love is determined to save us. So much so that he gave his son, Jesus Christ, to offer us this free gift of salvation, meaning if you want your sins forgiven and removed, you don't have to beg for it, you don't have to plead for it, you don't have to work for it. God is determined to save you because that's God. God is a God of love. And in his love, God has determined that your sin does not change your value. Let me say that again. There are people who think that I am so great a sinner, I don't think God would save me. And let me tell you something, your sin does not change your value. God is still determined by his grace to save you and you don't have to work for it, you don't have to earn it. God just wants to give it and that's God's grace. It is so big you can't contain it, you cannot change it, you cannot stop it. As those of you who know me, you know I grew up in the city of St. John's, Newfoundland. And I lived in a neighborhood called Monday Pond. And Monday Pond was a rather rough neighborhood, and I won't get into that today. But my best friend in all of Monday Pond was a guy by the name of Kevin Kennedy. Really great friend of mine. We're still friends today. And um, I remember when Kevin bought his first new car. Well, it wasn't new, it was used. And your first car tends to be, for a lot of us, a clunker and a junker. And Kevin's car was no different. As a matter of fact, I remember that it was a 1970-something Ford station wagon. And the reason I remember it was a 1970s station wagon is because it was a two-toned brown Ford station wagon. Anybody remember those? They kind of looked a little like this. And uh, this, this, was Kevin's, this was Kevin's pride and joy. We, we roamed the streets looking for girls in this car. I'm glad I found my wife. She's the best of them all. <laughs> I just got to put that out there. But we went cruising in this car. Well, if you drive a clunker and a junker, eventually you're going to have to do some repairs. And this is back in the day when, you know, you could actually work on your car and you didn't need a computer degree or an engineering degree to work on your vehicle. So one night, Kevin calls me up and he says, look, I need help adjusting my carburetor. And he said, can you come over and give me a hand? And I said, sure, why not? So I go over and Kevin said, look, all you need to do is turn the engine on when I ask you to and rev it when I tell you to. And so there I am, I'm sitting in the car, 20 minutes go by, and I am bored out of my tree. Now again, those of you who know me, you know that I'm a little, uh, or actually a lot, ADD. And the most dangerous thing that can happen to an ADD is to get bored. And I say that because we will find some very creative ways to entertain ourselves. And on this particular day, I thought it would be hilarious if while Kevin was working on the engine, I blew the horn. So there he is. He's got the hood up. And I'm looking out under the hood. You know, there's that space between the hood and your car, and you can just kind of see out through it. And I'm looking. And there's Kevin. And he reaches for that flathead screwdriver. And the moment it touched the idle screw on his carburetor, I laid on the horn, and Kevin shot straight up. He went up so fast, he hit his head on the hood of the car, causing Kevin to fall on top of his engine, and the hood of the car fell on top of Kevin, and his legs went straight out. Yes, I was a bit of a jerk. And I laughed. Oh, I howled. And the more I howled, the more furious Kevin became. And, and he was so angry, he stood straight up, hit his head on the hood of the car again, grabs the hood, slams it down, and comes over to the side of the car where I'm sitting, and he starts pounding on the window because I locked all the doors. I'm crazy, not stupid. So I, I locked all the doors, and Kevin is banging on that window. His eyes are red. He's got water in his eyes. There's stuff coming out of his nose. We'll call it fire and smoke. And and, and he's spitting. He's cursing and he's swearing. And he's swearing on his mother's grave that if he gets his hands on me, he's going to kill me. And all I can think in that moment is, I can't wait to do it again. (laughs) So why do I share that story with you? Well, my message this morning is entitled, The Furious Love of God, and when you hear that word furious, what comes to mind? Is it somebody who has, like my friend Kevin, a murderous intent? 
And maybe you're thinking to yourself, okay, but Pastor Bob, are you trying to tell me that when it comes to God, and, that God has a murderous intent? No, that's not what I'm saying. For those of you who like to take notes, um, in the dictionary, this is how we actually define that word furious. It means with intense energy. And yes, Kevin wanted to kill me with intense energy, but think about it. We say that Usain Bolt runs furiously. Michael Phelps will swim furiously. Gr Wayne Gretzky could skate furiously, and what we mean is they did so with an intense energy. And so when I'm talking about the furious love of God, understand that God loves you with an intense, passionate energy. God loves you, he's determined to save you, and if you let him, he will remove your sin. And here's the good news. There's nothing you can do to stop God from loving you. His grace and his love are big. It is like a flood. You cannot contain it. You cannot change it. And you cannot stop it. Because God's love for you, it is furious. Now, there was a time in my life when I struggled with this. And I, I remember when I was a young lad, actually younger than Jakob here today. And, and, and I remembered that I just, I had this picture that God was, he didn't love me so much as he was disappointed in me. It may have even been angry with me. You see, when you're a kid with ADD, you make a lot of mistakes. And when you make mistakes, there are times when the adults in your life become furious with you. They get angry with you. And most of my life, I grew up with people just being angry with me. So then I grew up to be an adult, and guess what? I still make mistakes. And there was a time in my life where I thought, you know what, God might love me, but I know he's disappointed in me, and I'm fairly certain he's angry with me. I was nine years old when I first heard the three angels' message. That's in the book of Revelation. And, and, and the hope of the soon coming of Jesus' return. It was an evangelistic series. And in that series, um, they, they had some amazing graphics back in the 70s. I mean, this was pretty top-notch stuff. The evangelist was Robert Kent. He was from Australia. And his series was entitled Dead Men Do Tell Tales. And his graphics, I tell you, they were like, wow. He had pictures of dragons and prostitutes. And when you're a nine-year-old boy, dragons and prostitutes get your attention. You know what I'm saying? And so there I am. I'm listening to everything. I'm taking it all in. But what I walked away with from that series was that I needed to get saved or otherwise I was going to get the plagues. Right? I mean, the book of Revelation talks about the seven last plagues before Jesus comes, and that's a whole other sermon and a whole other series. But I, I listened to that series, and I, I thought, man, if I don't get saved, I'm going to get the plagues, and those things, they sound nasty. And that picture of an angry God affected everything I believed. It filtered how I read the Bible. It filtered even some of the songs I was listening to on the radio. I remember it was Christmas. I had to be about 10 or 11 years of age. And my mom loved to listen to the radio while she was cooking in the kitchen. It was her thing. And I remember this very popular, this very well-known Christmas song came over the radio. And it went something like this. You might know it. He's making a list, checking it twice. Going to find out who's naughty or nice. And I, I, I was like, oh my goodness, Santa knows about the judgment. Right? And, and my picture of God's judgment was, he's making a list, he's checking it twice, and if you end up on that naughty list, there's going to be a whole lot of coal in your future. That's just where I was. It's just, and I realize that I'm not the only person who had this view of God. As a matter of fact, there were times when that view of God when I was young would keep me up at night. I had a very sensitive conscience towards this stuff. I was very sensitive towards it. And it would keep me up at night. I had pictures of getting, you know, dreams of getting the plagues. But you know, I was not the only young person to suffer from that. There was this young girl, her, she was 13 years of age, and her name was Ellen Harmon. 
Some of you might actually recognize that name. And Ellen couldn't sleep at night because she had these reoccurring nightmares. And in her nightmares, God would come to her and judge her and that he would be angry with her because of her sin and that he would take her and throw her into hell where he would burn her throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. I mean, what a nightmare to have when you're 13 years of age. And then one day her mother discovered there's actually no such thing as an everlasting torment in hell. And she shared that with her daughter, Ellen. And Ellen said to her mom, you can't go around telling people this, that, you know, there's no hell. And her mother looked at her and said, Ellen, why not? And she said, because if you tell people, they might not turn to God. And her mother looked at her and said, my dearest Ellen, if the love of God cannot draw people to Jesus Christ, the fear of hell never will. And yet I cannot tell you how often I have encountered people who have this fear of God because you have the wrong picture of God and you don't understand how furiously this God loves you. And, and it will impact everything you will do spiritually speaking. It will affect the way you read the Bible interpret the Bible, it'll affect the way you live your Christian life or the way you think you need to please God in order to get saved. And, and I remember, I, I, I couldn't believe how prevalent this was. I was out fishing one day on the Niagara Falls River. We call it the Niagara Falls Whirlpool. I think some people here, you've been there. And we were, I was fishing and I, I started making friends with another guy, a fellow Newfoundlander. And after oh, a couple of months of, you know, running into each other, he said, by the way, what do you do for a living? I said, okay, here we go. I said, I'm a pastor. And he said, oh. I said, I guess I gotta be careful around you. And I'm like, this is why I don't tell you I'm a pastor. And I said, well, why not? He says, well, I, I met your boss, and he says he does some pretty nasty things to people he don't like. I run into this a lot. And when I do, this is my response to people, and this is my response to you today, if you have that picture of God. There are two questions you need to ask yourself in life. These are the two most important questions you will ever ask yourself, and the first is this, is there a God? You have to ask yourself, is there a God? And if you've determined there is no God, then you know what? You get to go on with your life. One day you will die, and you will turn into cosmic dust, and that was your life. But if there is a God, this changes everything. So if there is a God, and you've determined that, the second biggest question, the second most important question you will ever ask yourself is this, is he for you or is he against you? Because let me tell you something, we're dealing with almighty God, we're dealing with somebody who can speak a star just through words, he can create a star just saying I want a star over here, yeah, put it right there. And he can speak planets and universes. Using his own energy, he converts matter into reality. If this God were against us, we wouldn't stand a chance. But if God is for you, then you have to come to the conclusion that everything he does is because he loves you. So when God says, please don't do this, you now know because of his great love, he's asking you not to do it because he wants to bless you or protect you or somebody you love. And if he says, please do this, you know that out of his love, he is still trying to bless you or protect you or somebody you love. Because if he's for you, then everything he does is to bless you, protect you, and he does it because he loves you. Now, I've come to the conclusion that he is for us. And the reason I believe that comes from this passage right here. It's Romans 8, 31. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Do you catch what he's saying? He is assuming, this is not an if maybe, this is an if since, since God is for us, who or whatever could be against us? And in particular, he's talking about the devil. If God is for you, not even Satan himself can take you down. Now, since God is for us, he concludes, since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up, as, up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? 
Now understand, it's not talking about God giving you a million dollars. Now I wouldn't mind a million dollars, but that's not what it's talking about. What Paul is saying, God was so determined to save you that he gave you the biggest, greatest, most precious thing he had, and that was Jesus. And if he's going to give you Jesus, then would he deny you anything else to be saved? You've already got the most important, precious thing he has. Everything else is peanuts to God. Do you hear what I'm saying? I gave you Jesus. Anything else you need is small potatoes to God because you already got the greatest thing. Let me give you an example of this. I have, when I was living in Alberta, I had some friends down in Calgary who were wealthy. And by wealthy, I mean they were filthy rich. So much so they could afford one of these. This is from the Lamborghini family. It's a Bugatti. Oh, they start around $2 million. And my friend and several of his friends could have easily afforded this. And so my curiosity was kind of working that day. And I said, listen, what do you pay for insurance for, for a vehicle like this? And he looked at me and he says, oh, anywhere between eight to $10,000 a month. My jaw dropped. I'm like, why in the world would you pay $10,000 a month for a vehicle like this? I mean, like, how can you afford it? And he said to me, if you can afford the car, the insurance is no problem. If God can give you Jesus, your salvation is no problem. And so this morning, I wanted to share with you why I believe that God loves us furiously. I want to share with you, using these three chairs here, why it is so important to have the right picture and understanding of God. And this morning, I'm going to share with you two versions of the gospel, and I've heard them both. One version of the gospel is the wrath of an angry God. It's the penal, punitive view of the gospel and the cross of Jesus Christ. The other will be God is for us. And so this morning, using these two chairs, I want to show you the difference between each gospel. It starts like this. In the beginning, there was God. And God created the heavens and the earth. And on the sixth day, God created man, well, to reflect his image and to enjoy a relationship with God. But in the garden, man sinned. And the problem is, the more we sinned, the more we kept on sinning. And now the law says that the soul that sins, it must die, and the wages of sin is death. Now, because God is holy and righteous, he can't look at sin, so God turns away from man. And now man is about to experience the white-hot, angry wrath of God poured out on all sinners. Oh, but thank goodness, along comes Jesus Christ, who stands between us and God, who is going to shield us from the wrath of an angry God. And well, God was well pleased in his son, Jesus Christ, because, well, Jesus always did what the Father asked him to do. And then one day, they took Jesus, and they nailed him to a cross. And on that day, God the Father did the unimaginable. He took all of our sin and he poured that onto Jesus. And again, the law of sin and death says the soul that sins, it dies. Well, now because God the Father is holy, he can't look at sin and so the Father turns away from the Son. And the Father turns away from the Son, get this, while the Son is perfectly obeying the will of the Father and when the Son needs him the most, but because God is holy, he can't have anything to do with his Son. Now, if you believe, now, now Jesus is about to experience the full wrath of Almighty God that was intended to be poured out on us sinners and God pours his wrath into Jesus and Jesus dies. And if you believe that Jesus gave his life, that God punished Jesus and killed Jesus as if to say, I don't care who pays as long as somebody pays, if you believe that, if you believe that God punished and killed Jesus, for your sin, then we are told you will be saved. 
And Jesus will take his robes of righteousness and cover you with them, and we become, as Martin Luther said, snow-covered dung. Or as other preachers put it, Jesus becomes our asbestos suit that protects us from the wrath of the Father. And if you believe this, you will be saved. But if you do not believe this, you will be lost in your sin, forever separated from God, and one day you too will experience the full white-hot wrath of an angry God intended for all sinners. And the problem I have with this version of the gospel is that in this version, God saves nobody. In this version of the gospel, God forgives nobody. And in this version of the gospel, it pits the father against the son. This is my problem with the wrath of an angry God gospel. And I cannot tell you how often this version in some way, shape, or form is still being preached that God killed Jesus in order to save you. I'd like to show you what the gospel actually is. Again, using the same three chairs, and we actually do start at the same beginning because in the beginning there was always God. God was always there. And, and God created the heavens and the earth. And on the sixth day, God created man, well, to reflect his glory and to enjoy a relationship with God. And in the garden, man sinned. And again, the more we sinned, the more we kept on sinning. And the Bible says that when sin is fully conceived in us, that sin will bring forth death. That the wages paid by sin is death. And the problem is, everybody dies because everybody sins. And so whatever solution God the Father comes up with, it not only has to deal with our sin, but it also has to do, deal with the fact that we all die. And the Bible says, for God so loved the world. For God was so determined to save the world that he sent his son Jesus in the likeness of all of us. And while on earth, Jesus came to show us who the Father truly is. Here we have a woman who was married to five men. Actually, the last guy she was with, she wasn't married to him. Um, she was just living with him. This is a woman who was desperate for love. But all she knew about love was that men used you and disposed of you. And so she went from bed to bed, person to person, just trying to desperately find that one thing she could never find, and that was love. And when Jesus found her, she was sitting at a well, and Jesus said to her, I am living water, and if you drink from me, you will never thirst for love again, because if you let me, I will love you. Here we have a man who was born blind. And the people said to Jesus, Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents? And Jesus looked at them and said, God doesn't work this way. This isn't because somebody sinned. He said, but now let me show you how God the Father actually treats human beings who suffer. And then with his own hand, the hand that created us, the hand that would be slain for us, with that same hand, Jesus gave sight to the blind. Here we have a man whom everybody hated. I mean, he was hated so much, nobody would sit down at a table and eat with this man. He was the loneliest man in all of Israel. And the reason people hated him was because he got rich. Now, they didn't hate him because he was rich. Everybody wanted to be rich. They hated him because of how he became rich. He became rich because he took money from his own people and he gave it to their enemies and kept a little action on the side for himself. And then one day Jesus comes walking down the road and he looks up in a sycamore tree and he looks up and there's Zacchaeus and he says, Zacchaeus, come down because I'm going, Zacchaeus, I'm going to eat with you today. And today, salvation is coming to your house. Here we have a man 
who was possessed by a legion of demons. This man was so out of his mind that when Jesus found him, he was living in a cemetery, he was running around naked, yelling and barking at people, cutting himself with stones. And when Jesus found him, this man came rushing towards Jesus and Jesus stood his ground. And Jesus said, I am here to set you free because whomever the Son sets free, they are free indeed. But now here we have a woman. And on seven different occasions, Jesus freed her from demon possession. And on this day, they caught her and found her in adultery. And the law of Moses says that if you commit adultery, you have to be stoned to death. And the men of her community, the leaders in her church, demanded her blood. And when Jesus found her, they brought her to him, threw her on the ground, and then Jesus stood between her and those angry men. And then he said to the crowd, he who is without this same sin, let him cast the first stone. And then he bent down, and he started writing in the dust. And we don't know what he was writing, Uh, I suspect it was the phone numbers of the girlfriends of the guys who were accusing this woman, but we don't really know. But what I do know is that the finger now writing in the dust is the finger that wrote that law on Mount Sinai that said, thou shalt not commit adultery. And with that same finger, the Son of God, God himself, the lawmaker, is now writing in the dust the defense of the one who just broke his law. When everybody left, Jesus turned to her and he said, please, for your sake, I don't condemn you, but please, go and sin no more. And then one day, angry men with violent hands grabbed Jesus. They took him and they shoved a crown of thorns on his head and then they began to punch him in the face while he was blindfolded. And then when that wasn't enough, they took Jesus outside and they whipped him. They beat him so bad, they tore the skin off his flesh and the flesh off his bones. He was nothing more than hamburger when they were done. And I'm reading this story. They're spitting on him. They're cursing him. They're mocking him. I'm reading this story, and I'm like, Jesus, why would you allow them to do that to you? Why would Jesus allow anybody to treat him that way? And here's what I learned. This was Jesus' way of saying to you and me today that there's nothing you will ever do to me to cause me to stop loving you. And so they took Jesus and they nailed him to a cross. And on that cross, he cried out, Father, Dad, would you please forgive Bob? Would you please forgive everybody who's gonna be at Nepean Church on March 27, 2021? And, and God the Father says to the Son, I can, I can take their sin and put it on you, but if I do, that forgiveness is going to cost you your life. And Jesus said, I don't care as long as you give them my innocence, my righteousness, and holiness in exchange. And God the Father did the unimaginable, and he took my sin, the sin for which the wages paid by sin is death, And he put that on Jesus. And then Jesus said, it's finished. I got Bob sin. Bob got my righteousness. Bob saved. It is finished. And Jesus died not because of the white hot angry wrath of God. He died because my sin cost the Son of God his life. It is finished. And with those words, Jesus died. And they put him in the same place to put all of us when we die. 
But here is the good news of the gospel of God's grace. Because from the tomb of Jesus Christ, I can almost hear these words, I am the resurrection and the life, and on the third day, Jesus was raised. And Jesus said, Jesus who cannot lie, Jesus who cannot change, Jesus who never broke a promise said, if you believe in me, even if you die, you will live again. Now, if you believe this, if you believe that Jesus died in order to save you, this is what happens. You get to spend eternity with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in an everlasting friendship of love. But maybe the bigger question is, Pastor Bob, what will happen if I choose not to believe? What will God do to me then if I decide to say no to God? What happens if I decide to turn my back on God? And here's what will happen. Francis Thompson called God the hound of heaven because God will never stop pursuing you. And if you turn away, God will still come after you. And if you turn away, God will still come after you because God is determined to save you. And the only way you can be lost is if you die in this position or if you make the decision to forever turn your back on God. And here's the thing. If you find that one day you are lost, understand it's not because he chose it, it's because you did. Because God in his love is determined today to save you. There's a young man out there right now. He's got a gun in his hand and murder in his heart. And God loves him furiously. There's a teenage girl out there right now and she's, she's scared to death because she's pregnant and she doesn't know what to do with her baby and God loves her furiously. There's a young man on the streets of Toronto. He's going to sell his body tonight just so he can eat, and God loves him furiously. There's a young lady over in Vancouver right now with a needle in her arm, and she might OD tonight, and God loves her furiously. Because you see, your sin doesn't change your value. And God is determined to save you if you will let him because he loves you furiously. I want to close by sharing a story with you. When I was 15 years of age, I was angry with my parents. And I was angry because I thought they were being very unfair to me because I was the oldest. They would put a lot of responsibility on me which meant I had to do a lot more of the chores, a lot more work, a lot more of this and that. What I didn't understand at the time was that my parents couldn't trust my brother to do anything, but they could put a lot of trust in me. But at 15, I didn't get that. So I was angry and I decided I don't know what it was that happened. I thought my parents were being horribly unfair and I decided I wanted to run away from home. And so I went to my best friend at the time, Kevin, who didn't own a car because this would have made what happened next so much easier. I went to my friend Kevin and I said, Kevin, I'm running away from home. And he said, what's your plan? I said, well, this is my plan. I'm going to take what little money I have, some of my clothes, and I'm going to hop on my bike and I'm going to ride all the way from St. John's, Newfoundland to Toronto. Why Toronto? Because I didn't know about Fort McMurray. And that's the two places where Newfoundlanders go. And so that was my plan. I want to tell you what a good friend Kevin was. He wasn't going to let me do it alone. So that night I went home, grabbed some clothes, all the money I had in the world. I had a part-time job. I had some money. I actually had enough money I could have flown to Toronto, but I didn't know it at the time. And I grabbed all my money, and I grabbed my bike. I caught up with Kevin, and we started riding. And we were riding down the Trans-Canada Highway. It wasn't far from where I lived. And we were singing and we were happy. I felt like William Wallace, freedom! Wow, we were happy kids. That was for the first couple of hours. And then midnight rolled around. And here we are on the Trans-Canada Highway in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it is 
dark as, as, as pitch black. It was a starry sky, but not a full moon. And, and it was pitch black. It was just forest everywhere, and we had nowhere to stop for the night. I'll tell you what a good friend Kevin was. I, I didn't tell you that Kevin had broken his leg, and right now he's riding bike in a riding cast. I didn't say we were smart. We were just determined. And so midnight rolls around, and uh, I'm trying to figure out, okay, man, what are we going to do because we're, we're not even close to anything I, I remember on this highway. And around midnight, I heard a car pull up behind us. It pulled over to the shoulder of the road, and the high beams went on, and I knew exactly who it was. It was my father. And, and I wanted, my instincts were to say, Kevin, ride for it. It's my dad. He's going to kill us but I knew a bike couldn't outrun a car and I didn't want my dad running me over. So we stopped. I understand my dad was one of those people who believed in tough love. (laughs) So we stopped because we had a little fear of my father. I think Kevin was more afraid of my dad than I was. And we stopped. My dad got out of the car and with him that night was my Uncle Jack. And I'm thinking, okay, that's it. He brought muscle. He's got enforcers. This is it. We're dead. I mean, my Uncle Jack had been former military. He had mitts like this, like a grizzly bear. My dad gets out of the car with Uncle Jack, and he says, boys, put your bikes in the back of the car. And without saying a word, we did as we were told. And then when we put the bikes in the car, Dad said, get in the car. And uh, I started walking towards the car. My dad put his hand on my shoulder and he said, no, Kevin, you get in the car. Bob, you stay here with me. And I thought, that's it. He's going to kill me. He doesn't want any witnesses. This is it. This is where my life ends. This is my picture of my father in that moment. My dad pulled me aside. And he put his hand on my shoulder. And he looked up at the sky and he sighed. And he said, son, it's such a beautiful night. I wish you had asked me along for the ride. In that moment, my picture and my understanding of my earthly father changed. And he didn't know it, but that night he changed forever my picture of God. There are some of us here, and I get it, you're running from God. And you've been running for a very long time. And you're running because, in part, you got the wrong picture of your Heavenly Father. He's not the God up there with a holy hammer looking to make you pay for your sin. But He's the God who is pursuing you and pursuing you and pursuing you. Why? Because not even your sin can change your value in the heart and the mind of your heavenly Father. Here's why I say this. Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Understand, your sin doesn't change your value. Your father is determined to save you because he loves you oh so furiously. And I don't know about you, but there was a time in my life when I got just tired of running. I was so tired of running. And when I came to understand just how much this almighty, all-powerful, all-loving God actually loved me, It changed the way I saw everything. And I have an invitation for you this morning. And my invitation for you is simply this. Stop running. Stop running. Turn to God and start having a conversation with him. And if you just start talking to God, you'll start seeing God, and he'll start pouring his love into you so much so It will change and transform your life in ways you could never possibly imagine right now. And this morning, I know there's somebody out there, you're sick and tired of running. I know. I know it because running gets exhausting. And maybe you're saying, you know what? I I, I want to learn more. I want to know more. 
I, I want to stop running and I want to turn to God. And God is asking you today to turn back and to come home because all is forgiven. And all he's asking you to do right now is just let him be a part of your journey and let that change your life. Amen.